now I'm liquefied. Uncle Joe. I think you should have shook it some more. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> the powder was still on top. <clears throat> <coughs> All right. This morning we're going to look in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and verses 4 through 6 will be our text. We're going to be talking about what time is it. Uh, and so if you're able to stand, stand with us please in honor of the Word of God. <coughs> As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight and the rough way smooth. And everyone will see the salvation of God. Let's pray. Father God, help us to be changed. And just as we're going to see in a moment in the preaching of John the Baptist, there was a call to repentance, to make a change. We pray that we also will be changed in our hearts, in our attitudes toward you and toward others in a positive and, and holy way. To speak to us and through us now, Lord, for your glory and your honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What time is it? Somebody tell me what time it is. What? No, that's not what my wife says. <laughs> Somebody else tell me what time it is. What? Oh, you're really off. Anybody else? There you go. You're probably a lot closer than anybody else. But how many times a day do we, do we think that? Or does somebody ask us, what time is it? You know, we, we look at our watches, we, 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 somebody comes up and they want to know if we know what time it is, you know, and, and those things. Why are we so concerned about time? Well, there are things to do. And there are things to stop doing. I mean, if you work till 4 or 5, you don't really want to work till 5.01. You want to know when 5 o'clock comes so you can go home. Uh, are, are there children to, to pick up? Are there medicines to take? Are, are there deadlines that have to be met? And, and so time becomes a very important thing to you and I. Now, John the Baptist also was concerned about time. And what was important to him was the time that he was to begin the ministry that God had planned for him, that God had prepared him for. Now, let's just go back a little bit. So a few weeks ago, back in December, when we first start, started our study in Luke, and we read about a, a young, uh, a older couple, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who were about to ha who uh, had no children, and Zachariah had gone to offer the the daily sacrifice in the holy place, and there the angel Gabriel came to him and gave him a message, and here's what the message in Luke one: Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. I'll wait. He will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteousness to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. That was quite a task that was being placed upon a child that was yet to be conceived in his mother's womb and whom would be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as John's time now came, he understood that he was to begin to tell the world what time it really was. So let's look at what John says in his preaching. He says, first he says, it was a time to preach repentance. The leadership of his day, as we're going to see in these verses, needed to repent. Look what it says. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, now Tiberius is the son of Caesar Augustus, and we remember him 
uh, from the, being the one who, who made the decree that there had to be a, a census taking. And that's why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem and, and that kind of thing. And, and Tiberius hated the Jews. We don't know why. There was no particular thing that happened. He just hated Jewish people. And any time that he could inflict conflict or, or pain, he was ready and willing to do it. And then there was Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. Now, this was not a, you know, today we, we hear people getting appointed to be ambassadors in certain places, and it's kind of an honor, you know, but there are some places that maybe are not quite as wonderful as others. So you could be an ambassador to France or some really beautiful place like that, or you could be an ambassador to a place maybe somewhere in Africa where it's not quite so nice and, uh, or somewhere in, in, the middle, in the Middle East, you know, where it's not so nice. But that's the way Jerusalem was, Judea was. To be made uh, a governor in Judea was kind of like not one of the best positions to get. And so he would not have been happy about being placed in this very hot and muggy uh, and, and dirty land uh, of, of Judah. But he also was, was a man who was not real fond of Jews either. And, and he wanted only people around him who would agree with him. And so he had the authority to appoint who was going to be high priest. Now, how he got that power, I don't know, but he did. And so he, he changed high priest several times during his tenure as the governor in Judea. Uh, and, and that leads to a whole other thing, because uh, Pilate was there because Herod the Great, you remember Herod, he's the one who ordered the babies in Bethlehem killed. But Herod had died, and, and, and he had divided the kingdom up among three, three of his sons. Uh, and, and two of them were, were still in control. The other, well, the third one didn't last long. He got in trouble and was replaced. Look what it says. There was Herod Antipas, who was the Tatriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tatriarch of the region of Ituria and Triconitus. Now, Philip's wife was named Herodias. You remember her? Yeah. She had a daughter. What was her daughter's name? Salome. Uh-huh, Salome. And, and, and she was married to Philip. Well, she took a hankering for Herod Agrippa. And so she left Philip to go live with Herod Agrippa, which was not really good at Thanksgiving when the family got together, as you can imagine. Uh, so and, and she also was the one eventually who, you know, asked for John the Baptist's head to be taken. And so there's no love lost between these brothers. And then the third ruler, the scripture says, is Licinius, who was patriarch of Abilene. Now, that's not Texas. Uh, that's a place there in the Middle East. He wasn't one of Herod's sons, but he was a political appointee. And it was during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, these two are going to show up often in the life of Jesus, during the ministry of Jesus. We're going to read about them time and time again. Uh, as, as having trouble and problems with Jesus. Uh, Annas was Caiaphas' father-in-law, and he had been, been, been appointed by Pilate to replace his father-in-law as high priest. And they were not men who were great spiritual leaders. They were men who apparently sought great political and, and uh, personal power uh, and more than, than spiritual truth. So, so we see that the nation of Israel really is in a bad time. Uh, it's in a bad way. With its rulers, there was cruelty and deception and a lack of real spiritual leadership and morality and apathy toward the Word of God. Almost sounds like the United States of America, doesn't it? So John began to preach that not only did the leadership of the day need to repent, but also the people of this day needed to repent. If ever there was a time that Israel needed to hear from God, it was then. I think about our nation, and my heart has been grieved, and I'm sure yours has too, all week, with the things that New York State has done. To say that you can abort a baby at the end of nine months of pregnancy, a day before it's to be born, you can go in there and kill that baby. Oh, I know they, they say, oh, that's not really what it means, but you, you look at all the stuff that they've written, and you know that's what it means. There's not a need. How many, uh, we have seen doctor after doctor who has come on and said there is never a need to abort a baby in the last trimester. Never a need to save a mother's life. May God have mercy on the people in New York. Anyway. If there was a time that Israel and America needed to hear from God, it was then. 
Verse 2 says, God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now, from a very young age, early teens more than likely, John had, had been taught and dwelt in the wilderness uh, among a group of people called the Essenes who, who studied scripture, who, who kept records and, and made copies of the Old Testament writings. And he has been there praying and preparing for the ministry that God had for him. John was not a people person. <laughs> He, he just, you know, he wasn't the good guy you'd want to invite to your parties, you know, to liven things up. John was not a people person. He was a guy who said exactly what he thought, uh, though he was always guided by the Holy Spirit. Dr. Chuck Swindoll, in his commentary, makes a little humorous uh, side note. He says that, that if you were to follow John's formula for ministry, uh, you may not succeed. Here's what he said. John the Baptist Ministry Growth Manual. One don't go where people are. Make them come to you. Number two, dress unattractively. <laughs> Camel's hair is what he wore. He ate locusts and wild honey. Speak offensively. <laughs> Point out their sins publicly. Four, rail against high-ranking government officials. Number five, encourage your followers to follow a more worthy leader. Now that you know, that seems like the, the, a, a book for, a guide for success, for, for failure, I mean. But it wasn't for John because the crowds kept coming. Look at verse 3. He went out into all the vicinity of the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So John comes to bring this message of repentance to the people of Israel. Uh, in Mark 1.15 it says, He preached the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come. Uh, repent and believe in the good news. Then Jesus preached the same message, Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So John is preaching the baptism of repentance. You, you've got to make some changes. Ms. Sharon talked about that a while ago. There's got to be a difference in us. So why was he saying there was a need to be baptized, to have a baptism of repentance? Well, think about why we baptize. Baptism for us is a symbolic act. It, it is an outward expression of an inward change. We, we have put to death the old way of life, we bury it, and then we bring it back to life as a new creation, as a new life, uh, and are showing our commitment to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Well, in Jewish culture, only Gentiles got baptized. If a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, they wanted to become a follower of God, then they would go through several things. Many of them would be circumcised if they were a male. Uh, they would have to study the, the Torah, the law. Uh, they would have to commit themselves not to eat certain things. And, and then another way was to be baptized, uh, to show that they were being cleansed of the old way of life they used to have as a heathen, but, and now being a follower of God. But John is saying to these Jews, you have broken your covenant with God. You have strayed so far from God, you don't even know who God is. Therefore, you need to repent. There needs to be an inward change in you, and then publicly declare that by going having a baptism of repentance, where you're saying to the world, I realize I'm not where I need to be spiritually. I'm not where I need to be with God. And, and I want to, to say to the world, this has happened inside of me, and my baptism is a way of declaring it publicly. Now, what is Repentance. What is repentance? Chuck Swindoll gives this definition. Repentance is the fruit of a heart yielded to God, not just regret when things don't turn out well after sin, not merely remorse, the emotional sorrow of getting caught in our sin. Repentance is an ongoing conscious decision to turn away from sin and to pursue God's plan for us. Repentance is not just feeling sad or sorry that we did something wrong or that we got caught. Repentance is really knowing in our life, yes, I have blown it, and I don't want to keep on blowing it. I want to be different. I want to change direction in where I am and, and where I'm going. I want to be different in everything that I say and I do. And so John was saying this is what these people needed. The leaders and the people of Israel needed to make some changes, and the changes would begin with repenting of their sin. And then John went on to say it was a time to prepare the way. Uh, Luke ties the ministry of John and Jesus uh, to the prophecies of the Old Testament. Again, we read a moment ago in our text. It is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah 
a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. John's ministry was going to awaken within the people of Israel an awareness of their spiritual need. You see, he, he, would, he was going to challenge and did challenge their, their, their lack of true worship and obedience to God. He said, you know, what you're doing is not worship. You're going through the motions. You're going to the temple. You're paying your, your money. You're offering your sacrifices. And then you're just living like God is not even around. I mean, how many times when you read through the Gospels, that's what Jesus said to them. You weren't really living out what you said you were. He would challenge them, and he would say to them, they needed a fresh touch. They needed a fresh touch from God. And, 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 and so he was preparing the way for Jesus to offer them this message of hope and forgiveness and purpose. When we look at our lives, perhaps we need a fresh touch. Perhaps we, we kind of have gone through those motions of, of we do all the right things, but there's really not a lot inwardly that's, that's being made different in us. We hardly have not really made that commitment. We, we, we say, God, revive us again, like we sang a little while ago, and yet we really don't want to be revived. We just kind of want, to, want, to, want God to make us feel good so that we don't uh, have to, to look at our, ourselves in a mirror of spiritually and say, I'm not where I need to be. But he says, every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low and crooked will, crooked will become straight and the rough ways smooth. Those things are barriers. The valleys are low and we have to go down and climb back up. The hills are too tall. We need something to make it a little smoother. And the barriers they had placed in their hearts toward God, God was going to smooth those barriers out where they could get to him. And they would hear and desire the message of John and the message of Jesus. Perhaps we too have, have barriers to Jesus in our lives. Maybe we fail to accept him personally. We've never ever made Jesus Christ Lord of our life. Or maybe we accepted him as our Savior because we don't want to go to hell, but we've never really surrendered to his Lordship in our life. Or maybe, you know, like we've, we've talked about before, maybe we lost our first love, that, that we aren't quite as excited about serving Jesus as we once were. And it's time that we have those barriers torn down. So John said there was a, a time to preach repentance and a time to prepare the way, but he also said there was a time to produce fruit. In verse 6, And everyone, Jew and Gentile, will see the salvation of God. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him. Now notice it says they came to be baptized by him. They came out. John didn't go to the temple and preach. John didn't go to the big cities in the town square and set up a tent and a crusade. John stayed right where he was in the wilderness and literally hundreds and thousands of people made their way from the cities to come to where John was to hear his message. Now remember that God had not sent a prophet to Israel in 400 years. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, was the last prophet in Israel. And 400 years had gone by since the people of Israel had heard a word from God. Oh, they had the, the Old Testament as we know it. They had the writings but there was no messenger from God among them to tell them what God wanted them, to, wanted them to do. And they had lost touch with God. And now John appears, and he, he is bringing this powerful message from God. And it's not a very easy one to hear. Look what he says. You brood of vipers. You bunch of snakes. That's what he said. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? The image John is painting here is like a prairie fire, you know, or a pasture fire. As it spreads across the grass, uh, the little animals, the snakes, and other things that are there, they begin to come out of their holes because it's getting too hot and they're trying to escape the flames. And that's what John's saying. You're trying to get away from the flames, you bunch of snakes. You want to know how to change? Therefore, he said, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Start living a life that shows you had a change in your life. Don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. 
For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Whew. Even now, the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. John says, you guys, you guys are right on the edge. God's ready to raise up a whole new people. And we know eventually he did through the Gentiles. But the Jewish people had long forgotten the need to be holy. And their faith was in their bloodline. We are Abraham's descendants. God made all these promises to Abraham. And we are good Jews. We can trace our family back to Abraham. So we're okay. No, you're not. That they were basing their religion upon the bloodline and not upon their obedience to what God's word said. It was not much different today. People say, well, I was sprinkled when I was a baby or I was baptized as a child. I joined the church. My parents were good Christians. I gave some money. I'm a good person. I was born in America. And we, we, we trace everything to some bloodline or some act that we did somewhere along the way, and yet there is nothing different about us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. I'm sorry, you can be as religious as you want to be. You, you, can, you can believe anything you want to believe about a lot of things. But you don't come to God except through Jesus. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not, not, not good works. Only through Jesus is the only way to get there. And still today, God expects, no, no, I would dare say he requires us to do more than simply say, I believe in Jesus, I've been baptized, I joined the church, I go once in a while. He wants more than that, and we know he does because he said so, Mark 8, 34. We studied this just not long ago. Summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That sounds a little more than just, oh, I joined a church and got baptized. How many of us are really doing that? Taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following him. Are we making a genuine, honest-to-goodness effort to be all that God desires us to be? That he's called us to be as one of his children? Look at verse 9 again. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, that's not a very positive picture, is it? He says, God, God is ready to slice Israel off. You need to repent. You need to turn back to him. You need to follow him. And we must understand that Jesus meant it when he said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name? And didn't we do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. I don't have any idea who you are. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Well, John has stirred things up pretty good now in his teaching. In verse 10 it says, then, then the crowd began to say, what should we do? What, what, what's next for us? What kind of fruit are you saying we need to bear? And so John gives them some examples. There is the fruit of unselfishness and sacrifice. He replies in verse 11, The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. These are acts of common decency. When we have the ability to do so, we are to share. We are to minister to others in the best way we can. Whether it's financially or, or, or some other way we can do, we are to do our best to help those around us to be uplifted, not pushed further down. There is the fruit of honesty and integrity. The tax collectors also came to be baptized, and he asked them, Teacher, they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? So John says, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Remember the greatest example of this in Scripture? A little man named what? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, yeah, Luke 19. 
But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Lord, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. <laughs> and if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. He understood what repentance was. He understood what it was to, to in faith and to act, to act in faith and trust in Christ and to be changed by him. Then there was the fruit of gentleness and contentment. Some soldiers also, these could have been Roman soldiers. They may have been temple soldiers, Jewish temple soldiers. But some soldiers also questioned him, what should we do? And he said to them, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. I call this the anti-bullying command. <laughs> he reminds us that because you have size or authority to bully others, don't. Just because you can, don't. Be content with what you have. Work harder if you want more, but don't force it from others. And then John said there was a fourth time that he be understood. It was a time for the power of God to be revealed. Now, the people were waiting expectantly. But they had been hoping that Messiah would come. And all of them were debating their, in their minds whether John might be the Messiah. <laughs> now, John begins to hear the whispers. John begins to hear the comments. The, he hears their hopes and their dreams being expressed that perhaps he was the Messiah, and so he quickly puts a stop to it. The one for whom John was preparing the way would be more powerful, he would be perfect, and he would be precise. First, he would be powerful. John answered to them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming who is more powerful than I. John says, you like my preaching? You go, you wait, just wait till Jesus comes. Just wait till the next one comes, who I'm preparing the way for. You, you, you think what I'm saying is tough? You wait till he comes and, and tells you what, what needs to be said. He is more powerful than I. Have you ever seen the commercials or the little clips on, on uh, uh, YouTube? I am second. You ever seen, anybody ever seen those? Yeah. They usually have a celebrity or some sports figure. Uh, someone who's well known, and 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 uh, Randy Moore from the local TV stations has, has done one. But they sit in this chair like this in a dark room, and, and they talk about their relationship with Jesus. And when they finish talking about what Jesus has done in their life, the last thing they say is, "I am second. I'm not first. He is first. I am second." And that's what John is saying. John, John is saying, "I am second. I, I'm beneath him. I'm not even close to him, really, is what John says. I, he, is, he is first. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. He is powerful, and he is perfect. Verse 16. I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. Now, if you were wealthy enough in Israel to have slaves, one of the jobs they were to do when you came in, you would sit down in your easy chair, your easy stool, or whatever, and your slave would come and they would take your sandals off and they would take some water and a rag and they would wipe your feet, the dust of them, off of them just to kind of soothe you and to help you. One of the menialest jobs you could have as a servant. And yet John says, I'm not even worthy to do that. I, I, you know, I'm not even good enough to take his sandals off and to wash his feet. Or he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 16. Dr. Trent Butler writes this. He, bought, he, bought, he brought the Holy Spirit as he baptized, but not just the Holy Spirit. He also brought fire as he baptized. The Spirit set the recipient apart as belonging to God's people. When we got saved, the Holy Spirit came into us and made us different than the lost world. And he, he, he set us apart as belonging to God's people and empowered. The Holy Spirit gave us power to do God's work. Fire purged and burned. Those who responded to Jesus received a purging baptism that implanted the Spirit within them and incorporated them into Christ's people of the kingdom. But those who rejected Jesus received the Spirit's judgment, a judgment expressed as a burning fire that would destroy them. So he comes with great power and he comes in perfection but he also comes very precisely. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn up with a fire that never goes out. 
when the farmer went out to, to, to uh, claim his grain from the grain fields. They didn't have combines back then. They would gather the grain into the house and into the, the floor, the grain house, and they would take a, a fork or a shovel and they would throw the grain into the air. And the heavy grain seeds and, and pods would, would fall to the floor. But the chaff, the stuff that wasn't any good, would fly in the air and it would be blown over somewhere else and then they would gather it up and burn it. As a pastor, over the many years that I have served as this church and other places, I have seen those who have fallen to the ground like the good grain. And I've seen them, even though they fall, they rise up and become more useful than ever before. But I've also seen those who seem to have to float away uh, without a real purpose in life. The verse 18, that along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. The word gospel is the word used here. It means good news. John preached hellfire and damnation, but he always followed it with the good news that forgiveness and mercy were available from God. And that's why they were to come and to repent, because God would forgive them, and God would restore them. But then lastly, John says there was a time for persecution to begin. Listen. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say, because I want you to hear this. You don't hear anything else, hear this. When we make a choice, when you and I, we make a choice to walk in the path that God has prepared for us. When we choose to speak the words that accurately reflect God's word and God's will, when we choose to stand on what is right, what is moral, what is biblical, then we should anticipate that persecution is going to come. Notice verse 19. But Herod the Tatriarch, being rebuked by John about Herodias, his brother's wife, and about all the evil things that Herod had done, added to the, this to everything else, the many other sins that Herod had, had committed, he locked John up in prison. You see, one of the things that, that I have found is the persecution that comes when you try to stand for what's right and what God's Word says. It will not only come from the enemies of Christ, but sadly, even at times, from those who claim to be a part of the body of Christ. I have friends. I have pastor friends. And I'm sure probably there are some folks here who don't always agree with what I say. There are folks who didn't agree with me and have left because of some of my views on homosexuality and uh, uh, other things. But there are folks who don't always agree with me on some moral and social issues. But as much as I love them, and I love the folks who disagree with me, that's I do. And I'm, as much as I want to walk in harmony with them, and, and I want to present a unified Christian message to the world, I cannot not call sin, sin. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. I cannot change what God's Word says about it to be politically correct. I can and I do love the sinner, but I cannot, I must not, I will not love the sin or excuse it. So whenever we take a stand, persecution is going to come, and that's what happened with John. John took a stand, and persecution came. So then what time is it for us? What time is it for us? Is it time for us to not only preach repentance, but also to practice it. I know in my life that's true. There are things that I need to repent of. There are things that I need to get right between me and God and between me and some other folks. And I've been trying to do that. Not only to preach it, but also to practice repentance. And it's time for us to prepare the way so that others, our friends and our family, and may come to know Jesus also. And that means we have to live for Jesus and obey His will and His Word. Is it time for us to produce fruit, godly fruit, 
by doing the ministry he's called us to do and, and obeying what his word says we're to do and not do. Is it time for the power of God to be fully released and evident in us? There's an old hymn that we sing ever so often. I didn't think about making it the invitation hymn, but we should have probably. But let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story. Be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. And then lastly, is it time for us to be willing, ready and willing, to face whatever persecution, rejection may come our way if we stand on the truth? I pray we will. Father God, help us again to understand what time it is. This is not a time for we who are believers to cower back into a corner and say, oh, we're just in so much trouble, we can't do anything about it when we have the God of the universe who is our God. And Father, while men may make laws that destroy life, we can pray, Lord, that you will come into the hearts of women who are thinking of destroying those young lives, those babies, and you will speak to their hearts and you will bring them, surround them with people, Lord, who will minister to them and help them through this time and adopt those babies and help them to, to function well, Lord, if they want to keep the baby. Father, help us each to look at our own heart and, and to see what we need to repent of. Whether it's our own arrogance, whether it's, Lord, a wrong attitude, whether, whether it's, it's not being concerned with the things of, of, of you and the, the work that you've given us to do. Whatever it is, Father, help us to repent and produce works, good works, good fruit that honors you. And Father, then help us to be ready to face whatever persecution may come. Lord, what time is it? It's time for us to stand up and be who we are. To stand up and, and speak out. And to share the love of Jesus with those who are so far from it. Father, to speak to our hearts today and for someone here who doesn't know you yet, who has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, we pray that today they will do so. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our invitation is to make me a blessing. Boy, that's what we need to be in this sick world we're in. We need to be a blessing. As we stand and sing, let God have his way in your life. Number 670.